Good morning. Um, welcome to the Institute for Security Studies weekly view on Africa briefing. My name is Stephanie Walters. I'm the head of the Peace and Security Research Program at the Institute for Security Studies. And today we're going to look at some of the recent developments in the DRC. Um, so for our online listeners, uh, welcome. Um, thank you for joining us. The last time we looked at the DRC was, um, I think, in late September. And there have been quite a few developments since then. Um, and so today what I'll focus on primarily is the political accord that was reached uh, on October 18th and what the implications are for stability and elections in the DRC as a result of that political accord. And I'll also touch on some of the developments since then, the Security Council visit um, and also the um, speech that Kabila gave yesterday to, to, to Parliament. Um, so we, after, after several weeks of ongoing talks at the political dialogue level in Kinshasa under the auspices of the AU mediator Edem Kojo, um, and as many of you will remember, this national dialogue was essentially boycotted by most of the key opposition parties. There were some that did participate, notably Vital Camere of the Union Nationale Congolaise, um, but the Rassemblement um, boycotted the uh, talks, as did the MLC, and so Chisikedi, the MLC, Moise Katumbi, Olivier Kamitato, quite a lot of heavyweights did not participate um, on the grounds that it did not um, address some of the key issues and on the grounds that they weren't happy with the facilitator. The Catholic Church withdrew from the talks in September after the um, violent repression of protests in Kinshasa led to the um, killings of several dozen people and did not return to the talks. So when the accord was signed on October 18th, you had a very small group of participants. You essentially had key members of the Majorité Présidentielle, the ruling party, um, and then some members of the opposition and a small contingent of civil society groups. The important thing to retain about the October political accord is two things. Uh, one, that the election date, according to that accord, is in 2018. And the second, that there's no specific language about limiting Kabila's mandates to two, uh, and there's no language saying that the constitution cannot be amended during that transition phase. So from, from, from the perspective of, of an analyst um, and, and those of us who are, who are looking at this as a potential um, beginning of, an, of, of a solution to, 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 to the instability, it really ended up being the worst case scenario. What we had hoped for, of course, was a more inclusive dialogue, uh, we'd hoped that uh, that perhaps the Catholic Church could come back and that the Rassemblement might join, um, and that would have required concessions from the government, um, notably on the election date and on specific language about Kabila staying. Um, now we have an accord that really, uh, under no circumstances, can be acceptable to uh, either the political opposition or, it seems, the international community, um, because it, it really gives us a, another two-year waiting period with a potential extension of that until we have those first elections, so 2018, and again, no clarity on Kabila leaving. So it hasn't um, met any of the requirements that we, we, we think are necessary to try and stabilize the situation or to chart a, a, a clearer way forward, if you will. Um, this accord was endorsed by SADC and the ICGLR at a, at a joint summit in Luanda on October 26th, um, which was what we expected. The region has been very supportive of these types of efforts to, to um, if you will, find political compromises through domestic means. Um, so SADC and ICGLR endorsed that, that, that political accord, which on the face of it um, is, is something that, that, that isn't terribly helpful, if you will, um, in the sense that it, it really gave Kabila, uh, in addition to the domestic victory that he got, where he, he basically never had to make any concessions, also the endorsement of two key regional blocs. So initial reaction to that endorsement was, was that this, this made the situation even more difficult. So now we have an AU-mediated uh, process, so an AU-endorsed process, and it has the, the, the approval of two key regional blocs. And so the question was, you know, what kind of leverage do we now have to try and potentially uh, get some concessions out of the government that could be acceptable to the opposition and in that way stabilize the situation in the DRC? Um, I think there are there is reason to be somewhat hopeful um, at this point, and 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 there are two key reasons for that. Um, although the SADC, although SADC and the ICGLR endorsed this uh, this political accord of October 18th, behind the scenes, Angola, who is a key player in the DRC, 
um, appears to have made it somewhat clear to the Kabila government that the accord needs to be more inclusive. So in other words, more people need to sign up to it and, and adhere to its outcomes. And in order for that to happen, that there needs to be some concessions have to be made. And, and, and we, th we think that those concessions uh, will be or should be around the date. So perhaps the 2017 election date and also clear language around um, what Kabila intends to do. So we still haven't heard the president say, I am leaving uh, in 2018. Um, we know that these efforts are, this was something that was communicated to the Kabila delegation at the SADC summit. And we have since seen Angola take the lead again on the DRC um, in the context of its leading the UN Security Council delegation that was in Kinshasa late last week and over the, over the, the early part of this week, where again, Ambassador Martins, who, who led that delegation, also delivered um, and, and showed solidarity, I would say, with, with the message that was coming from the UN Security Council about the need for a more inclusive dialogue. Now, why is Angola important? Angola is important because it has um, been a, an important ally of Kabila's for a very long time. It's a very powerful country. It has a very powerful military. It's always played a very important behind the scenes role in Congo Kinshasa and also in Congo Brazzaville. So it has leverage. Um, and their reason to be hopeful at this point is because if, if Angola is willing to speak clearly with Kabila uh, about the need to improve aspects of the dialogue, then that means that potentially he will be listening to that uh, message from them because they can influence whether he's able to stay in power. Now, Angola's interests in the DRC are not necessarily um, motivated by a desire to see a functional democracy. They're primarily motivated, we believe, by the fact that Angola doesn't want to see large-scale instability in Kinshasa in particular or in the country on a wider level. And so the sense is that the Angolans are frustrated with Kabila because he hasn't been able to come up with an iron-clad uh, um, structure, let's say, for this electoral delay. So whereas in Burundi we had um, the Constitutional Court interpreting the Arusha Agreement in such a way that um, allowed Nkurunziza to go for a third term, or in Rwanda where we saw a referendum, or in Congo Brazzaville where we saw a referendum, the sense that the Angolans have, uh, uh, we believe, is that this political accord of October 18th is simply, it's too leaky, it's too imperfect, it's too easily contested, and it's not going to do the job. In other words, it's not going to seal the deal on, on exactly uh, what happens after December 19th. And this seems to be what's motivating Angola to try and get Kabila to make some more concessions. Now, of course, that view is shared by other members of the international community who have made it quite clear that they're not uh, happy with the terms of the Accord or with the fact that it's not inclusive. So on that front, we now see an alignment between a key regional player, Angola, and the rest and other players in the international community, the United Nations, the UN, uh, sorry, the, the, the US, uh, Belgium, other big countries, the UK as well. Um, will that alignment last? It remains to be seen, but for the moment it is a powerful, I think, alignment of interests. Um, the other reason to be somewhat hopeful um, is that um, the Catholic bishops are now back in, 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 on the scene. They are, are again involved in trying to broker a wider political agreement. Um, this is something they were asked to do by Kabila uh, after the SADC summit. So again, uh, we feel that it's linked to um, the message that Kabila will have received at the SADC summit from his regional uh, allies. Um, and again, the Catholic Church has tremendous uh, credibility. It's, uh, it's a very legitimate player um, it isn't tainted by um, political aspirations, which many of the political parties um, have shown. I mean, that's, that's a normal uh, dynamic of political parties. And so they really are seen as a, a viable, uh, neutral uh, force. Um, their job, essentially, is to go out and get more buy-in um, for the political accord. Now, it's nothing will change if Kabila doesn't make some concessions. So um, if, the, if the bishops are reaching out to the Rassemblement, and we know they have, and we know that the Rassemblement supports that effort, um, just to use them as an example, but, there can, but, but the election date and language about Kabila leaving and about term limits is not explicit in a new version of the accord or an addendum to it, then even the bishops will fail. I mean, as much credibility as they have, they have to be able to put something on the table. And the 
person who can decide whether something is on the table is essentially at this point the president of, of the DRC, so Joseph Kabila. So we haven't seen any new um, new offers. Um, of course, a lot of this is happening behind the scenes. Um, but we will that that, uh, that mediation does continue, and um, and 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 we may see something coming out of that in, in, in the coming days. It it comes at a slightly awkward time um, in the sense that the political accord put out a very clear calendar about the formation of a new government of national unity and the appointment of a new prime minister. That was all to happen within a certain period of time. There's been a slight delay because of different interpretations about the start date of the accords implementation calendar. Um, in any case, <coughs> yesterday. Um, November 14th, the uh, Congolese Prime Minister resigned, and that position is now vacant. Um, it certainly would seem that that position could be a key element in how the Sen Senko is a a able to bargain with some of the opposition parties. Um, and, and that is a new element that has arisen since the accord was signed. Prior to that a new initiative, I think the sense was that someone like Vital Kamere might um, get the position of prime minister. Vital Kamere, of course, being the, the key opposition figure who participated in the dialogue um, and who many believe sort of delivered that accord for President Kabila. And so the sense was that he might get the reward uh, and the job of prime minister. Um, there are other names, notably uh, Leon Kengo Wadondo, who is currently the president of the Senate. Um, and who's sort of um, playing both sides of this of the political divide a little bit, um, and then a few other names that are probably not not really terribly viable, notably Azarias Rouberwa, who used to be the leader of the uh, RCD rebellion um, and and then come, turned political party. But I think that 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 would be a bad move on Kabila's part because of the rumors around his association with Rwanda and so on. It would just be politically um, quite damaging, I think, for him to choose that person. So it's at this point, we think probably between uh, Kamere and, and Kengo, but there may be other names. And of course, there's um, this, there's talk about how the government has approached Chisikedi. Um, we, we haven't substantiated that in any particular way at this point. Um, I think Chisikedi uh, at this point isn't wouldn't be willing to accept that job. He would lose uh, tremendous credibility if he did accept it um, without some kind of concessions being made on, on the electoral calendar. But that announcement is imminent. Um, Joseph Kabila made a speech yesterday in Parliament, um, which followed his prime minister's um, resignation, where, where and he doesn't often do that, and, and, and that's why it's extremely closely watched, especially under the circumstances. Uh, it comes after the Security Council visit. It comes after the resignation of his prime minister in the midst of these negotiations with the opposition. Um, of course, everybody, as always, was looking for clues as to what he intends to do um, and, 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 and whether or not he, he, he would like to stay on in power. Unfortunately, his, his speech didn't give any real clues about what he intends to do. He reverted to the language he's often used, which is that uh, the Congolese government will respect the Congolese constitution, um, which is, I guess, you know, could you could interpret as meaning uh, because there are two mandate limits. In other words, he won't go over those mandate limits. But I think at this point, in order for there to be stability, you need that to be made explicit. It shouldn't be couched in this type of of, of legalistic language. I think. Uh, Everybody has made that quite clear to him that he needs to speak clearly about whether or not he intends to stay, and so he didn't do that. Um, and in fact, his his the tone of his speech yesterday was quite combative. Uh, so he spoke about foreign interference in the DRC. He spoke about um, the supporting the Senko and the bishops' efforts to um, to bring in other parties to the accord. But he also said that the country would not be held hostage. By a, a fringe of the of the country's opposition, um, he spoke strongly about um, making veiled accusations about um, potentially the opposition manipulating or using violence to achieve its means. Um, and so, it overall, it was not a speech that 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 gave a sense of concession reconciliation that was really um, designed at bringing the opposition into the fold. I think in, in many ways it was it was extremely aggressive towards them and also towards the international community. Um, so the Security Council visit um, took place over the weekend. There was a meeting with Kabila. There are sort of divided opinions about exactly what Kabila said there. 
Um, the, the Security Council's message is very, very clear. Um, they're, they're supporting dialogue. They think there needs to be a, a more inclusive group of people who adhere to the political accord. And so clearly not an endorsement of the roadmap um, that, that has come out of the political accord. So uh, the Security Council would not have been seeing eye to eye with Kabila um, over the weekend about that. Um, the last thing I want to say before we go to questions is, is just that, um, you know, one, one must remember, in addition to the combative tone of, of Kabila's uh, speech yesterday, which, you know, because he speaks so rarely and because the moment is so tense, I think is something that will not go unnoticed and that was significant. It would have been deliberate um, and it was sending a particular kind of message. And I think that we can um, make some conclusions about what kind of an attitude we can expect from the Congolese government. And of course, the important thing to remember as well is that all of these events since October 18th and before that, before the dialogue, or when the dialogue started are taking place in a context of ongoing human rights violations, ongoing arrests and harassments, harassment of civil society activists, of politicians. Um, and then more recently, and even more blatantly, uh, a, an absolute crackdown on freedom of speech and freedom of expression. Um, we've, we've seen in the last 10 days, the Radio France International signal being shut down in Kinshasa. Um, and this is a very, well, in the country, it's FM signal. It's a very, very significant radio station through which many Congolese do access important information. Um, so that signal was shut down. Um, and so was the signal of Radio Okapi, which is the uh, radio station set up by MONUSCO uh, many years ago and which has a lot of credibility and is an important source of information for a lot of people uh, in the DRC as well. That has since been turned back on, presumably because of the Security Council visit, um, but Radio France International has not been turned back on. And since then, the government has tabled legislation um, demanding that all international media partner with local media before they can be on air or operate in the DRC. And so, so this is an important thing to remember is that um, we, we, we have ongoing very mixed messages. So the, the bishops going out there and trying with a mandate from Kabila to, to convince the opposition to adhere to a political accord and at the same time uh, violation of basic fundamental rights of freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, uh, and so on. Um, and that's really important, I think, to emphasize um, as we try to, to move forward. So uh, a lot of possibilities potentially, um, uh, but also very mixed messages coming out of, the, out of the Kabila government at this point. Thank you very much.